Oh, yes. From deep, deep in the heart of Ottawa, Canada. <laughs> it's the Soul Jazz Orchestra with Mojuba. Uh, they play fusion music, and I do enjoy the music a lot. This is Lead Stories. I'm Utrice Lead, and we have a very interesting program, I think, today. Uh, the first half is information laden. The second half is debate focused, I hope. All righty, so let's start. Kim Ives is our guest today, and he's going to be our principal guide, as he always has been, on matters relating to Haiti. He's an investigative reporter, an independent documentarian, and editor of the English language editions of Haiti Liberté. It is one of the most influential and widely disseminated uh, publications regarding Haiti, all things Haitian practically. Uh, he is here to update us on what's going on in Haiti. The last time we talked, Haiti was experiencing widespread uh, protests and violence relating to uh, accusations by the people of corruption in government. Since then, it has spread and taken on another level of uh, meaning because there has been an acute fuel shortage uh, and that now compounds all the other things that had been happening before. So he's here to update us on what is going on in Haiti. And Kim, it is always a pleasure to have you with us and a great privilege to have you with us. It's always a privilege to be on your show, Utrice, and uh, I'm glad to be back with you now. Well, tell us what's going on uh, with uh, tell us what's the state of affairs, I should say. We could start as generally as that and then hone in. Well, it's a, um, I could say, a slow motion train crash, train wreck happening uh, in Haiti. Um, the most current manifestation is, of course, this fuel crisis where uh, – People are unable to fill up their cars, to get uh, kerosene for their uh, cooking, to get um, diesel. There's blackouts uh, across the country, more so than usual even. Um, for instance, one of the uh, energy providers has had to cut its megawatts down from 50 megawatts down to 15 megawatts. So... Uh, the situation is very dire. The dollar, which um, uh, 33 years ago, in 1986, when Jean-Claude Duvalier left power, was set by the government at uh, five gourds per dollar, uh, is now uh, going at 80 gourds to the dollar. Uh, the one dollar will get you 80 gourds. And uh, this is, that's the Haitian national currency. <clears throat> so this is uh, part of the reason why now we see this tremendous uh, crisis in terms of uh, being able to purchase gas. It, it, in short, I would say, and I don't want to glaze over your uh, listeners with a lot of um, the economic uh, uh, minutia of uh, how the exports and balance payments and uh, exchange rates, etc. But in short, let's just simplify it down to the bottom line. This is really the collateral damage of the Trump administration's escalation of the war against Venezuela. Uh, this is Haiti is simply a collateral damage, if you will. Uh, we have to go back to uh, 2006, uh, 13 years ago, when uh, 
President René Preval came into power, uh, Venezuela then, under the leadership of the late Hugo Chavez, was uh, was rolling out a, a program called Petro Caribe, where essentially Venezuela was giving to poor neighbors in the Caribbean cheap oil uh, with huge credit. Uh, in, in Haiti's case, they only had to pay 60% of their uh, bill up front, and this was for cheap gas. Uh, and this was at a time when gas was at 100 bucks a barrel. So it was a tremendous uh, uh, godsend for the Haitian economy. And uh, then 40% of that revenues from those gas sales in the country uh, would go into a fund called the Petro Caribe Fund, which uh, has been the source of uprisings really this past year, uh, as people realize that at least $2 billion of this fund uh, were embezzled, uh, went into uh, all sorts of schemes and uh, bank accounts of government officials and did not end up going to serve the people, to go to projects supporting the people, like schools and hospitals and roads and clinics, all these things that it was supposed to have been used for, it was not. Instead, it went really to enrich the group that took over the government in 2011 called the PHTK, the Haitian Bald-Headed Party which is a, essentially a neo devalurist group of uh, scoundrels, uh, really a mafia of um, drug dealing, uh, uh, arms dealing, uh, all sorts, of, you name it. They were in ev every shady business you can think of. And um, they made off with about at least $120 million dollars and this is according to Pamela White, the U.S. ambassador. That's what uh, Reginald Boulos, one of the biggest uh, bourgeois businessmen in Haiti, said uh, in an in a article just this, uh, this week in the Nouvelle East, uh, that according to him, she said $120 million was what the Martelly clique made off with. So people have been up in arms about the, the theft of this Petro Caribe money uh, already. But what happened is, as we know, the uh, Clinton slash Obama sector, the globalist sector, already was waging war with Venezuela, with uh, Nicolas Maduro. The Cubans believe that, in fact, uh, Chavez was poisoned. Um, uh, the, the Venezuelans believe that as well, but the Cuban doctors were the ones caring for him. And um, Nicolas Maduro came into power, and um, uh, Trump, as we know, uh, assumed office, and uh, he immediately, with his ultra-right uh, advisors like John Bolton, etc., uh, really stepped up the campaign of sanctions and sabotage against the Venezuelan government we see most recently this week, past week. At the OAS, they held a vote uh, to not recognize the inauguration last week of uh, President Maduro for a second six-year term. And um, in any case, part of these sanctions made it impossible for the National Bank of Haiti to continue to pay its bill to Venezuela because essentially there were sanctions against uh, anybody who was dealing with Venezuela. And so the Petro Caribe deal essentially was killed by Washington in November 2017. So really since then, Haiti has had to buy its Money, it's gas um, uh, on the international market, and primarily the U.S., and they were dealing with this company uh, 
out of uh, Houston called Novum, which is basically a reseller. You know, they go buying gas and wherever, Trinidad, Venezuela, Middle East. And um, they'd given Haiti some sort of um, credit lines of 45 days, nothing like the Venezuelans gave. Basically, the Venezuela, the terms of Petro Caribe was Haiti could pay back uh, the 40% it owed on um, its bill uh, uh, over 25 years at 1% interest. So it was a pretty great credit card that Haiti had, but that credit card has gone away. So now they're paying COD for all their gas. And um, essentially, this uh, the Haitian government, uh, as the, the, the economy has continued to spiral down, has been unable to pay this gas bill. And so Novum said, you know, we got five uh, ships sitting out there in the harbor, but we're not paying, we're not giving it to you until you hand over 80 million bucks. And uh, the Haitian government gave them a partial payment of about uh, uh, 40 million, but they still have 40 million to go. And um, this is just complicated just to wind this up. Uh, Utrecht, uh, by the fact that the Haitian government, in its in its uh, groveling before the uh, Haitian business class, said last March that it would take all its payments in gourds uh, rather than dollars, because it used to be the businessman who had to come and pay them dollars, so they had dollars to pay for the gas and things like that. But they said to all their big uh, bourgeois uh, friends like the Bouloses, like the Meuse, like the Bigios, like the Brants, all these big families that run the country, that uh, it's okay, guys, you can just pay us in gourds, and we'll, we'll go find the difference. Well, <laughs> now they're paying for their, uh, uh, um, you know, no good deed will go unpunished. Uh, well, it wasn't a good deed for anybody but the uh, those rich people. So uh, this is really what it is. It's it's the policies of the rich, the wars of the rich against the countries like Venezuela, uh, who offered this solidarity fund, the solidarity gas to Haiti and to, six, to uh, 17 other countries in the Caribbean. Uh, this is being basically smashed by the sledgehammer of this uh, Trump uh, sanctions against uh, Venezuela. And, you know, Haiti is now, the Haitian people are now paying the price. Well, in the next segment, I was going to deal with uh, the U.S. open declaration that it is seeking to oust or seeking the ouster of Nicolas Maduro. But isn't this an irony? Mm -hmm. Haiti was given such a good deal through the Petro Caribe offer of Hugo Chavez. That fell to pot because of corruption. The money was to, the savings, I should say, was to be reinvested in rebuilding infrastructure and schools, like you just said, hospitals and so forth, as well as to uh, help the employment situation, the unemployment situation. Now you have ships. At the same time, the people are without fuel uh, to run their cars and even their stoves, their elementary kind of existence. They have no way of doing that without fuel. There are ships in the harbor. It's almost like a, a daily taunt. You have, we, we're here, we're ready to sell you the gas, sell you the fuel, but we need the money and we need it now. At the same time this is happening, we have, as I will get to in the, in the next segment, we have an open, almost like a declaration of war from the Trump administration against Haiti, uh, saying that we are looking for the replacement of Maduro in Venezuela. We're looking to replace his government. 
were looking essentially to help in his ouster. Uh, how do you read this? this? This is massive confusion and wrong on so many levels. Yeah, well, this is uh, simply um, the world's greatest bully, uh, or as uh, Martin Luther King, who's uh, birth- Martin Luther King Jr., whose birthday we celebrated yesterday, called the greatest purveyor of violence on the planet. Uh, they are using that violence uh, against Venezuela and against Haiti, too. I, I should say Haiti is getting also direct violence from the IMF. We should not forget that sort of the enforcer of the U.S. Um, uh, of economic dictates is this International Monetary Fund, which visited Haiti uh, at the beginning of last year and uh, said, oh, well, you don't have any cheap oil anymore and you lost your credit card. Uh, you're going to have to um, stop subsidizing oil prices because essentially the government has been underwriting the oil, the, the the cost of gas in Haiti uh, to keep it low. It's it's some of the lowest prices in the Caribbean um, for for gas. And they said you got to take away those subsidies. And uh, the government complied, and uh, immediately Haiti went ballistic. That happened um, as we talked about on this show on July sixth, seventh, and eighth of this year. There was a total uprising against uh, the hike of the cost of gas, which went up like 51% in the case of gas, uh, in the case of kerosene, uh, you know, 49% in the case of uh, gas, I think, and a little less for diesel. But uh, all of this meant they had to re this, this uprising essentially made the government step back and say, you know, okay, okay, we, we, we take it away. But the IMF came back the next week and said, listen, okay, you can do it a little more slowly, but you are taking away those subsidies. Um, now, you know, these subsidies largely, I should say, uh, um, uh, underwrite the rich because they're the main ones who use most of the fuel, as in any uh, country across the world. Uh, is most of the energy consumption is done by the rich to you know, air condition their houses and run their big refrigerators and their hotels and their whatever. So um, uh, just to break down some of the figures that are out this week, um, the subsidy, about $14.5 billion of it, or 20%, go to the, to the richest 20% of Haiti. Now, saying Haiti is about 11 million people, that means about 2,000, 2,200,000 people. And $14 billion go to the poorest 80%, which is most of Haiti, which is about 8,800,000. So if you, if you break that down, that means each uh, rich person in Haiti, of the 20% richest, you're getting a subsidy of about $6,600 yearly. And every poor Haitian is getting a subsidy of about 1600 so uh, you see this huge disparity in the subsidy. So, uh, uh, but essentially, the um, IMF, the enforcer for the uh, Washington uh, uh, world, uh, wants those subsidies removed and for the people to pay the price. So, so while you have this war against Venezuela, which was essentially saying, we are going to give the wealth we have that has been for years stolen and sent directly to the metropole. We're giving it to our neighbors to help them raise up their level, build the capital. Because, as you know, Eutrees, all these countries throughout Latin America and the Caribbean were previously colonies. All that They don't have capital. They don't have the tremendous wealth we have in the United States, you know, which consumes 45% of the world's wealth. We, that's why everybody's trying to come here to, to get a piece of that pie. But all these countries, their capital, their wealth has been stolen. And here was Venezuela making the effort to try to redress that imbalance, to say, here, we sit on the world's greatest reserves of oil. We're going to share it with you. We're going to. And 
Washington, the IMF, and the United Nations, which is at their service, has come and just brought down the hammer on this and tried to shatter it to bits. And that's that's what we're seeing is, is this uh, tremendous crisis happening. While the crisis is happening, there's a lot that's not happening. And among uh, the things that are not happening, it seems to me, is a concerted effort on the part of regional organizations like the uh, Organization of Caribbean States and other. Well, of course, you just made the point that very few Caribbean nations really have the kind of capital reserves to help uh, deal with the situation. But we also talk about the Central and South American states, which also are going through their own versions of uh, financial and economic stress. But just the same, even if it's about issuing uh, public statements and in some way showing solidarity, why is it that we don't see much of that happening? Well, you know, this is the policy of... um bullying and bribing that the U.S. carries out uh, worldwide. I mean, we saw it last week on, or on January 10th at the, um, at the OAS, the Organization of American States, which Cuba uh, calls Washington's Ministry of Colonial Affairs. Uh, but they have been trying to um, organize essentially – an invasion. Uh, the, U- the Washington has been trying to organize an invasion of a military invasion to, to oust Maduro. They know they can't do it through the usual means, which is the Security Council of the United Nations, because Russia and China will veto it. Uh, so they're, they're blocked there. But they turn to their junior varsity, which is the Organization of American States. And they have in place a thing called the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which was passed on September 11, 2001, in the midst of all that emotional emotions of that moment. And essentially, um, it uh, says that if two-thirds of the members of the OAS, which consists of most of the nations of Latin America, except for Cuba, which was expelled in 1962 uh, because of its revolution. Um, but the other uh, 35 members, well, there's really 34 because Honduras has been sort of uh, put in uh, uh, stasis since uh, the, the uh, coup there, um, even though it was U.S.-backed, but the other countries were so outraged by it that they they insisted. So there are 34 members, voting active members of the OAS. And Washington has been working hard, lobbying, uh, trying to get these nations to vote against Venezuela and essentially to invoke the Democratic Charter, Article 21, which says if two-thirds agree, we can send in uh, a, a, a force to uh, take power back from whoever the people have put in. Uh, right now, in the vote that was done on January 10th, they uh, got 19 votes, and they need 22. So they're three votes short. But the outrageous thing was, the unthinkable thing was, Haiti voted for that, not to recognize the legitimacy of Nicolas Maduro. Here's a government, <laughs> here's a nation that has given $4 billion to Haiti, and now you stab them in the back. And so this shows the power of Washington to just, you know, pummel and beat. And Haiti, uh, we can say since 
um, Jovenel Moise, the current president, came into power, there, there, you know, we could see this coming. In fact, we predicted it uh, in Haiti Liberté in our editorial the week before the vote that said, watch out, he's going to vote with the U.S. And everybody said, oh, no, we can't. Nobody would do We can't. But he did. And here we see, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, betrayal of the Venezuelan people by this uh, government of uh, Jovenel Moise, which is essentially caught, uh, as they say in Creole, in a diagonal, a diagonal. In, in the English proverb, might be more a rock in a hard place. Uh, he he um, has on the one side Washington, you know, breathing down his neck, hovering over him, and on the other side, here's Venezuela saying, come on, dude, we gave you all this this help. And so uh, in the first vote, the uh, uh, which was taken just after Jovenel came in in March 2017, the first vote in the OAS, excuse me, uh, the, the ambassador, you know, totally uh, denounced the U.S. proposal to uh, not recognize Venezuela. In the second vote, which happened last year, last June, they abstained. They abstained, which was already outrageous in the minds of Haitians. But now they have voted with Washington against Venezuela. And to me, this means the end, really, of the uh, Chauvenel Moise government, because the Haitian people, even rightest people, you trees, that I, you know, I, I follow one of the best barometers now of public opinion are these, you know, WhatsApp talk groups and discussion groups. And you look down, and even right-wing people are outraged or disgusted by it because it's just so unjust. Everybody recognizes what Venezuela has done for Haiti. But here they have bowed. Haiti has chosen, picked its side. But as they say in Creole, bien côté mal calculé, you count well but calculate badly. I think they've calculated badly. They think that the power and uh, 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 good will of the U.S. will uh, now be forthcoming that they voted against Venezuela. But I think the power of the people is going to be much more determinant in this, and I think it'll mean the, the end of the uh, Jovenel Moise government before its five-year term is up. So this adds yet another layer of frustration for Haitian people. How is it being expressed because I mean when it reaches this point people are more concerned about how they will survive in a given situation something as stressful as you know a fuel shortage which is uh, on top of another layer and another layer and another layer of misery right. do they even are they even factoring is there a, a sense of awareness, wide awareness, that this is what their government has chosen to do at the most uh, inauspicious time. Yes, yes, the people, I think, are clear. And, you know, the Haitian people are, um, as I've said many times on this show, I think, you know, they're always in the vanguard historically. They were the first independent nation of Latin America. They were the first country in 1990 to start to foil U.S. election engineering with the election of President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, which then set sort of the template, the example for Hugo Chavez and Evo Morales and Rafael Correa and all the other uh, political revolutions across the continent, which are now being turned back, of course, through U.S. Uh, uh, policies. Uh, we see Brazil has gone back and Argentina, Chile, you know, they're taking them back one by one. But so this, there's this tremendous geopolitical fight going on between the empire and the people of Latin America. Uh, but the people of Haiti are clear, I think. And, you know, they, they uh, only lack one thing at this time, and that's really you know, what Lenin called a fighting organization, you know, a party which could really lead and organize this this rebellion. Right now, it's more a little bit like the Gilet Jaune we see in, in Paris, this sort of, uh, you know, thrashing body of the pop, 
population uh, fighting, but there, there's no real leadership. There's no head on the body, if you will. So, um, you know, I, I know Haiti Liberté is, of course, in close contact with all the progressive currents in the country, and there is a, a real effort to, uh, you know, build this this party, this organization that can fight. But the people are clear, you know, and they want that too. And uh, they need to really take back this government, which uh, was hijacked through the good auspices of our friend Hillary Clinton and um, Barack Obama back in 2011, given to this mafia clique, the PHTK. But uh, the, the people want to reclaim their government. And I think uh, with this move by Jovenel of bending over for Washington and bowing to their dictates on Venezuela, I think this spells his doom. And um, I, I think the Haitian people will be able to get together and reclaim their, um, their own government. Well, as always, thank you so much for your deep insights into what is developing in Haiti and how it is affecting the people, not just in Haiti, but in the diaspora as well. Thanks so much, Kim, for being with us today, and let's follow up again soon. Okay, thanks as always for being there for Haiti, Eutrice, and uh, I look forward to the next show. Okay, thank you. We'll take this break and come back to a related issue right after this. On PRN.FM, I'm Eutrice Lead. The Trump administration says Venezuela is not a real democracy. And those were the exact words. It's not a real democracy. And so the administration is actively encouraging the ouster of the country's president, Nicolas Maduro, saying his recent re-election was rigged and therefore illegitimate and invalid. So we are asking the question of you, are the U.S.'s involvement and actions regarding Venezuela legitimate? 888-874-4888. The intention, the avowed intention of the United States to trigger the ouster of a president because they believe or they say that and and they contend, the administration contends, that Nicolas Maduro was returned to office illegitimately. And Venezuela is not a real democracy. And so it is doing what it can, and it it is not hiding it, to remove him from office. Now, first, what does that mean to you? And the question, the larger question is, is this a legitimate thing? that the United States is doing and what should, in your view, what should be done about it, if anything. 888-874-4888. As we hear from Kim Ives, we see how complex the situation is. And that is to the point where nothing is as it seems. It seems that people are upset because they don't have fuel. But when you get into the depth of it, you see there's a whole different thing happening here, including the possible, I mean, is the U.S. prepared to invade Haiti? 
Is the U.S. prepared to go to war with Haiti? Is the U.S. prepared to do something outrageous, uh, you know, we, as we have seen in other parts of the world, where leaders are assassinated, uh, and we have no idea who is, wh which is the hand that is doing all of this, and why are they doing it? And we come to recognize, as we have been discussing this issue for a long time with regard to Haiti, as poor as Haiti is, it is one of the richest countries because of its mineral deposits, it's got oil, it's got gold, it's got a lot going for it. As poor as Haiti is, and this goes, uh, we know how the Clintons reacted to Haiti on so many levels. Uh, we still have $10 billion unaccounted for in post-hurricane reconstruction funds, and that's under Bill Clinton. But let's discuss this question, which is related to the first part of the program. Is what is being said, contemplated, openly championed, by the current administration, that Haiti is not a legitimate, not a real democracy, and its leaders, not Haiti, I'm sorry, uh, Venezuela is not a legitimate uh, uh, republic, and therefore the president of the country just recently re-elected to another six-year term has got to go, and the implication is, of course, the United States would assist in that process. Marie from South Carolina, you're on the air. Hi, how are you doing, Yatrice? Fine, thank you, Marie. How about you? Hanging in there. Um, every time I hear this, I'm like ready to cry. Every time I hear them, how they've attacked Venezuela, that is the corporatocracy, basically. And no, it's not legitimate. Um, Trump's just playing by the same handbook that's been going on and on and on and on and on. And um, the, the, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not going to be in front. I don't know all there is to know about it. But what I do know is that I just, I'm just sick and tired of, you know, being in a country that just gets off on just attacking sovereign nations and always in the name of oil and don't forget mining, as you mentioned there, and everything else. So, no, it's not, not legitimate what he's doing. They ought to be ashamed of themselves, and the Democrats ought to be ashamed of themselves for not saying the thing, which just goes to show you they're, you know, same coin, there's two sides of different, same, same, two sides of the same coin. And after having looked at um, William Bloom's book, Killing Hope, and then seeing how that goes on, and Josh Perkins' um, Confessions of Economic Hitman, even mentioning that about the mining and how the oil was first found there and that type of thing. And, um, Several others, um, trying to think, oh, Mick, Michael Preisner, I think his name was, the vet, who has his website or blog called um, Eyes Left. He does an excellent explanation about um, pretty much debunking John Oliver, who a lot of friends I know just love mainstream media, including John Oliver, pretends he's not, just taking a piece and making historical references. It's always, it's always, everything's always just based on a lie. It's all about money. It's all about what land. should. What, in your opinion, should be done about this open declaration? Not, if not of actual war, but intended actual war. What should be done about it? People ought to just call them all out in their crap. We need to go to our reg or to our legislators first and just dare them to say something. I bother them all the time. They don't always say anything back, but just tell them that we're not all stupid. And the only thing that I can do on my level is that, contacting them and just, you know, letting them know, hey, we're all not dumb. And then the other thing is, like, every CITCO I go to, I'm not sure if they're getting the money or not, but CITCO is actually a Venezuelan-backed company. And I kind of wonder why all the prices were, like, lowering everywhere around here in South Carolina and Greenville area. And then all of a sudden there are all these, um, I won't say their name, another gas station that's popping up directly across and near the CITCO stations. And I said, well, I knew they weren't doing out of the goodness of their hearts. And it's all because you're just trying to, like, just mess with Venezuela, lack of a better word. And that's one thing we can do. We just need to call them out on it. And if there's any way that, you know, we can get any kind of word to our friends who are here and there in Venezuela, and I know a few here who've told me a lot and taught me a lot, too, 
tell them, like, we're for, you know, the people having their own democracy. You know, enough of this, self, you know, invading sovereign states and declarations of semi-wars, or they don't ever declare a real war. They're just ready to attack everybody. And why is the United Nations saying anything? Of course, the, the United States, or are they? But, absolutely. So we are exploring the issue. We're exploring the issue and raising people's consciousness about it. So that Definitely. the next time we talk about Haiti, uh, we don't fall for the old thing that, oh, well, it's just a corrupt country. And yeah. these people are incapable of governing themselves, or in the case of Venezuela in particular, a bunch of communists with some strange it ideas. Is. So yeah. we should not, as, as the people, we should not feel any particular... Uh, 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 I should say, we should not in any way commiserate with them, nor right. should we examine the role of the United States in a situation that is developing. It is, in my view, a critical situation. Thanks, Marie, for your call. Jose from you. Rosedale, you're on the air. Greetings, my professor. Uh, thank, you. thank you. You know... One doesn't have to be a genius to see and to feel the effects of this, this, uh, uh, oh, this evil system called uh, imperialism. The tentacles of the United States is all over the affairs of poor people. It is, their intention is to keep us in the condition that we are in. And... Uh, they are saying to us, what can you do about it? We don't seem to have the economic might and the, and the military might to go up against them toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And uh, unless our people are prepared to sh for the shedding of more blood, and when I say blood, the, uh, uh, it must be a, a strategic shedding of blood. We have to be able to hit those people, the, the puppets that they place in our midst to guide our fears. We have to be able to let them know that you cannot live among us in peace. You are going to walk and look behind your back. If we cannot face them on that, uh, on that front, we are not going to make an edgeway because we cannot appeal to the public officials that we, we elect to put to, uh, in office. Because every single one of them, even if they went in there with a good heart and good mind, they get corrupted in a few seconds, and they are part. They become part of the system. I just got through sending a letter down to the Jamaica Gleaner, which is a, 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 a paper that's been there like a pariah in the midst of, of, of us in Jamaica for the longest. It's been owned by by white folks. And it's been spreading the vile propaganda for hundreds of years from the days of slavery until today. And I just sent off a letter because the government of Jamaica has done a dastardly deed in voting in favor of the United States against Venezuela. A country that has been so kind and reach out to so many of us in the Caribbean and Latin America and so forth. That oil deal that the uh, former president... Uh, uh, of Venezuela has given to the Caribbean to help the, the people. Chavez. It was not designed to help those charlatans, that is, those political criminals, and their the bosses, the private sector. It was designed to help the people of Jamaica. And it wound up being a cash cow for the political folks and the, and the, and the private sector people. And today, like, like they're scavenging now, they're, they're reaching out to, this, to pull the, the flesh of Venezuela because they got their orders from their North American uncle. And they are reaching out to destroy the, the taste blood. They feed, they want to divide up all the spoils of the petrol jam uh, uh, oil refinery in, in Jamaica. They are running and scrambling now to divvy up the loot among themselves. It is a disgrace. And I, I told them that, that Jamaica, not the, the politicians and the, and, the, and the bosses, but the people of Jamaica, is who is going to pay the price for this dastardly betrayal of the Venezuelan uh, uh, people? With respect but, to the Trump administration's position, mm -hmm. what, is, what is your view uh, the, the, that the administration openly has declared 
hostility toward Venezuela. It's openly advocating uh, removing uh, head of state and it is directly interfering in the sovereign uh, state with its propaganda and with its uh, belief that the, the elected, re-elected head of state must be removed. How do you categorize this position? To that, I will say, ask the question, what has changed? The policy of the United States has not changed. It is a policy of imperialism. We must control and dominate all these, this, these economies in these, these satellites. It's, it, they, they can't say these places their own. They are satellites that they are supposed to dominate and control. The policy has not changed. Whether it's Democrats or Republicans in charge, it has not changed. It is one system of imperialism, of exploiting those that don't have the power to fight back. And the world is sitting by. There is no agency in this world that will stand up to the powers of imperialism. There is no power. So we are on our own. The power is completely on their own. From the Caribbean to Central and South America to the African continent to wherever our black and poor people of color reside. We are at the mercy of the invaders, the imperialists, the, the capitalists. We are at their mercy. Who is there to help us? As I said, we have to be able to make the sacrifices and go after those in leadership who are there as parasites on the backs of our people. If we can't take those stand and make the sacrifice, they will have no respect for us. They will continue to annihilate us. They will continue to wipe us out. They will continue to rob and plunder our resources. And we will sit and discuss it and to ask about whether it is right and just. We know it's not right and just. I don't have to be a genius to tell you that what the, the America and Europe and these countries are doing to poor, to poor nations is just. You read Charles and Stephen one the right now can look at it and say he's not just. So to ask that question, I mean, we, we don't need to ask that question. Well, we, mean, we do need to ask the question because So who's going to respond to many it? People are, many people are not aware. B, many people are not making the links. They think it's Venezuela and Haiti. They don't even understand the historic links. They don't understand it. So it's a matter I don't know of what we're doing in the beginning. All right, we have to move on. But thank you so much for your call and for your contribution today. David from Brooklyn, what are your thoughts um, on the question? Good afternoon, you trees. Um, I've David. been listening to this discussion, and what uh, uh, comes to me is that the United States of America is at this time the largest empire in the world. Um, all these other smaller countries that we're talking about are just uh, clogs in the wheel of imperialism. And the ruling class that has the masses of people in this country under their thumb and manipulates them very successfully with this corrupt system called the two-party system uh, that serves the interests of those who rule. I uh, have to realize that they have that system in effect here in the continent of the United States and throughout the world. Uh, I would think the number one evaluation uh, that they think about is the pliability of whatever kind of government is in effect in these other countries, how well they're in harmony with the goals of the imperial, I'd call it United States, the mother country. So uh, even though once in a while a more progressive government comes in and one of these smaller countries. Uh, it won't be long before that's overthrown and it goes back. So that's what's happening in South America now. And uh, it won't be long uh, if it continues before 
they do the same thing in Venezuela. So, but, okay, uh, so, but let's build on this. But, let's, let's but most up. of all, people have to get it through their heads. You know, I know it's hard that, first of all, you don't live in a democracy in this country. And this is no democracy. Um, and the point is, uh, how can it be a democracy if a small ruling class essentially runs everything? And... That's the last thing they want in the lesser countries that they rule over is some kind of democracy. This is a massive game uh, of imperialism and maintaining empire for the interests of the ruling class of the United States of America. So, you know, uh, this is nothing new. You can predict what they're going to do anytime you have some kind of progressive government like uh, uh, you have in a place like Venezuela. So it's uh, very sad that uh, uh, you can't even find information in the so-called paper record. I mean, the, uh, the, the reporters that they have for somewhere like the New York Times that write these articles that they seem like they're made up for uh, by uh, a public relations firm for the U.S. State Department. I mean, the articles are so bad, uh, they give no context of in terms of what's happening. Uh, you're not going to find anything on television uh, or on most of radio. It, it is ridiculous. So the people are that's, 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 in check, and it's a terrible thing we're living with. Let's get specific, though, about this particular situation. A the president of the United States and his administration have openly and formally taken a position that the president of another country, which they harbor great disdain for, is not legitimate and must be removed. Mm. Hey, well, uh, what does, uh, what does uh, that that's, that's not surprising. to you? Uh, you're what talking that... about uh, the uh, executive officer of an empire. That's Trump. And right. he just makes that decision. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but uh, he can get away with that, and that's exactly what he's doing. He... Uh, decides that these people are not falling into line and, uh, you know, we're going to take some action, uh, you know, and John Perkins explains that very well in his, his book, uh, uh, Confessions of the Economic Hitman. So, you know, this is, uh, this is par for the course. This is what you're going to get for anyone who disobeys the ruling elite here in this country. So you, all this you, stuff about democracy is a farce. Heard. Um, here's a question. Based on the statement and the severity of the statement, the, the very severe words being used, would you put it past the United States to engage militarily with Venezuela? Oh, no, that wouldn't uh, be a problem with them at all. As a matter of fact, uh, ruling class people, uh, especially ones connected with the uh, defense, i.e., that is, war industry, would love a little, little war like that, you know? And look at the profits you make going into a place like Venezuela, uh, killing all these brown people down there, and or a lot of them. And uh, uh, that might up um, uh, Trump, Trump in the uh, uh, valuation with his uh, you know, uh, racist base, and uh, he may get a big bounce up with that. So I'm I'm not surprised at that. That that's, could be a possibility. If he does not do that, uh, he'll get one of these satellite countries, that's what I call those smaller countries, maybe to go in and do, do it for him. You know, he puts enough pressure on them and, uh, you know, lets them go in and do that. So uh, this 
is a terrible thing, and people have to understand, number one, they live in an empire. Number two, that these people that they run out and vote for and, and have these biggest <laughs> elections okay. for, it's just, just ridiculous. getting our cues and we're out of time. Thank you so much, though, for your profound comments today, all of you. And we come back to each other tomorrow. Bye-bye.